we can uh, start uh, the event. So um, to everyone joining, uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you uh, all for joining tonight's virtual uh, panel discussion in light of the upcoming general elections here in the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Peter Tau, and I am primarily a history student at the Erasmus University here in Rotterdam, uh, currently working on my thesis and hoping to graduate this academic year. But besides that, I'm also a board member at the Honors Association, which is organizing tonight's event, and I'll be facilitating and moderating, moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, so because tonight's event is public, uh, there might be some people joining us that are not too familiar with our association. So allow me to briefly introduce it to you. So the Honors Association is the official study association that represents all honor students at the Erasmus University Rotterdam. And this means that we are both an international and interdisciplinary association with students coming from all different uh, disciplines and faculties at the Erasmus University. One of our main goals is to be a platform for both academic and professional development, which is why uh, we've organized tonight's event on a very relevant topic. So uh, what is tonight's discussion about? Well, in two weeks, uh, Dutch citizens will be allowed to go to the ballot boxes for the, um, for the House of Representatives elections of the Dutch Parliament, or in other words, the Dutch general elections. Uh, and this year, it'll be a bit different from normal years because of the COVID-19 situation. However, uh, despite COVID, uh, the campaigning season is in full swing, as you might have noticed on the streets, the television, and of course, the internet. Uh, and as an international association, uh, we noticed that many international students were often not very familiar with Dutch politics and therefore wanted to learn more about it. Um, that is why we came up with the idea to host this event in English to give both Dutch and international students the opportunity to engage with politicians about relevant societal topics. So we are therefore very honored to be joined by several politicians from different Dutch parties uh, running in the upcoming elections. Uh, so please allow me to introduce them to you. Um, starting with GroenLinks or Green Left. Uh, green Left is a green political party that describes itself as green, social and tolerant, uh, combining green and left wing ideals, uh, as the name suggests. And they are currently uh, they hold currently hold 14 of the 150 seats in the House of Representatives as an opposition party. And on behalf of Green Left, we are joined by Sen Amatouf, who is the highest deputant on the candidate list for the upcoming elections, coming in at number five. Uh, and she is an experienced policy economist at the Ministry of Finance and is committed to a fair and green economy that works for the people. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, we are happy to have you. For thank the, you. Here. Thank you. <laughs> for the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, or VVD, VVD we are joined by Ruben Brekomans. Uh, the VVD is a conservative liberal party that was founded on the classical liberal philosophy, focusing on the values of freedom, uh, laissez-faire, and deregulation, while also being committed to the ideals of the welfare state and multilateralism. Uh, the VVD was the largest party after the last elections in 2017, with 33 of the 150 seats, and of course, is the party of our current Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. On behalf of the VVD, we are joined by Ruben Brekomans, who is number 30 on the candidate list, uh, and Mr. Brekelman currently works as a program director at the Ministry of Finance as well. And his goals are to keep the nation safe for everyone, get a grip on migration, uh, offer support to businesses, and stand up for our interests abroad, something which he thinks can only be achieved through cooperation. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. All right. Um, from the Labour Party, or PVDA, we are joined by Kavish Bisseswar. Um, the PvdA, or Dutch Labour Party, is a social democratic center-left party founded on traditional social democratic values and committed to the core interests of employment, social security and welfare, as well as public education, healthcare and public safety. And after the previous elections in 2017, the Labour Party currently holds nine uh, of the 150 seats in the House of Representatives. Uh, we are joined by Kavish, who is coming in at number 14 on the candidate list, and he currently works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a diplomat at the Dutch Embassy in Beijing, uh, hence the opening uh, talk. And Kavish's goals is to revive the social uh, democratic ideals and fight for fair chances for everyone concerning education, healthcare, living conditions, and employment. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, we are joined by Itai Garmi, representing Volt. Uh, Volt is a very young, uh, pro-European and European federalist political movement that serves as the pan-European structure for several parties in EU member states like the Netherlands. Uh, and this is the first time Volt will be running in the Dutch general elections uh, through the conviction that the current challenges require European cooperation, and they are committed to strong European cooperation, investments in a greener, fairer, and more equal economy, and more public-private cooperation to fight unemployment. 
Itai Garmi will be representing Volt as the campaign leader and number 11 on the candidate list. Uh, Itai currently works as a cyber strategy consultant at Deloitte Netherlands and wants to dedicate himself to providing a positive contribution to society and the country uh, as he believes that politics is the best means of achieving this goal. Thank you very much for being here. Um, so just before we get into the discussion, I would like to briefly outline the structure and some rules and formalities to make it as smooth uh, as possible. So the event is structured in uh, three approximately 30 minute rounds during which the students will have the chance to interact with the politicians. Uh, first, we will have two uh, 30 minute rounds on relevant topics uh, of sustainability and national security. And during these two rounds, the politicians will first briefly pitch what their party's position is. And afterwards, the floor will be open to questions or comments from the audience about the topic of that round. After the first two rounds of 30 minutes, we will have a final round of 20 minutes during which the audience can ask any questions they might have for the politicians. We highly encourage participants to join in the discussion by using the raise hand function in the participant section of Zoom or by typing uh, your questions in the chat. Uh, if you only want to type your question, that's totally fine. And you can just type it in the chat and I'll uh, monitor them and ask them on your behalf. Uh, but you can also ask a question or comment yourself and interact in the discussion by using the raise hand function in the participant section. Uh, then I can give you the floor to ask your question and to interact in a respective manner. Uh, and lastly, in order to maximize the interaction, we would very much appreciate it if you could turn on your video as well, especially when asking a question, uh, but of course, only if you feel comfortable doing so. Lastly, uh, yeah, raise hands, take precedence over questions in the chat. With that being said, I believe it is time to dive into the first round, uh, which is the topic of sustainability. So as mentioned, uh, we will start by giving each politician the chance to pitch their party's position on a statement regarding sustainability. Uh, thus, every politician will pitch for two minutes, and afterwards we will open the floor to any questions uh, from the audience regarding the topic of sustainability. So the statement uh, I communicated uh, is as follows. So the, the economic crisis that the world finds itself in during and after the COVID-19 pandemic requires the Netherlands to focus on supporting and rebuilding the economy over climate measures, even at the expense of international agreements. So to, uh, pitch, to start the pitches of two minutes, uh, I would like to first give the floor to Senna uh, for GroenLinks to uh, give a team minute pitch on this, uh, on this topic. You can stop sharing your screen now, by the way, just to see each other. Hey, good evening, everyone. Great, and thank you for opening the screens as well, because I've been uh, having, I've, I've had a great Zoom day, but it's lovely to see different faces. Um, as you can imagine, as a Green Party, uh, the topic of sustainability is very important for us. And I'm going to start, and I know normally you're not supposed to do that, but for the panel discussion that I think there's a, a false clash in the, in, in the thesis that Peter mentioned, as if there is a clash between sustainability and going back to a world uh, that we had with growth. Because one of the things that we strongly believe is that we're going internationally, going through a transition, and that as the Netherlands, and especially as Europe, this transition is going to happen, whether you want it or not. It's, it's coming towards us. Some parties are still, well, sometimes I, I, I feel like maybe we should, I, I, I wanna be the same, but I think if, if you look at the reality, if you look at the reports, if you look at the facts, we have, we're going to have to deal with this. So we believe that it's very important to invest ourselves out of it, to be fast in that transition, um, to have funds available, and also to put, to, to have our industries, to reform our industries, because we're very conservative in that way. So that's the, the first thing I wanted to say. And the second, the second thing I wanted to say is that in order to make that transition, we need all the strengths we got. So we need to, to we, we need strong industries, we need cre creativity, we need, we need innovation. Uh, uh, we need one of the big limitation at the moment, for example, is people good with good technical will and, and hand on knowledge. So these are things that you'll find in our program that's also translated in English. And I'm looking forward to the other opening statements. Uh, thank you very much. Um, all right, then we're going to give the floor uh, to uh, Ruben Brekomans for the uh, baby day. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, I agree. It, I think I also believe it's a false contradiction, but I want to mention a few things. I think first, rebuilding the economy is going to be a key priority in the next couple of years. Um, I think what you now experience as students that you have a year in which you have only been um, in Zoom and digital meetings like this and following your courses in a way that, of course, uh, is not so inspirational. I think it would be even worse if you then 
go graduate from your education and then go into the labor market and then there are no jobs available because we're in a bad economic situation. So I think in the short term, of course, it's very important to get out of this crisis, this COVID pandemic, and hopefully that will happen over the course of the year. Uh, but then it's also important that we stimulate the economy and make sure that we go back on a path of growth in which there are enough jobs available. And in our election program, that was a key priority. And therefore, we, with our program, we create the largest number of jobs compared to other political parties. Uh, but I agree that it should happen in a green way because we are, of course, also committed to the 2050 goals, to the Paris Agreement. We consider that to be very important. Um, and therefore, the investments that we make, the, uh, also the, the sectors that we focus on, we should, we should encourage this transition and make sure that we invest in green technologies, for example. We should be careful, though, because if we tax our companies too much, uh, more than the countries around us, and there's a big risk that they will move to other countries in Europe or outside Europe. Uh, and then they can pollute even more than they are doing right now. So that would be bad for both the economy and would be bad for the environment on a global level. Uh, so let's be careful that we do it in a smart way and make sure that we stick, of course, to our international agreements, but that we also collaborate on a European level. And I'm very happy that we um, were able to have a 55% goal on the European level and that our prime minister had an important role in reaching this, uh, this agreement. Um, so there are both priorities and I think they can be combined. Let's grow in a green way. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Then next up, I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, the Labour Party. So Kavish, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with the previous speakers because um, it's evidently a false dilemma, right? I mean, if we do not do anything about the climate emergency, which is going on right now, we don't have an economy to worry about at all in a couple of years. So that's first and foremost. And also, if you just simply look at the economic recovery, because it's going to be a monumentous task to rebuild our economy after this, this pandemic is arguably the biggest crisis since the Second World War. So we have a giant task ahead. But from what we did through uh, our central planning bureau, basically you give your election manifesto and then they come up with calculations and basically our manifesto shows that you can have a strong economic recovery coupled to significant measures that reduce the CO2 emissions of uh, the Netherlands. So a green recovery is possible. So it's not either or, it is and and. So that's something to uh, keep on top of your mind. Um, so don't let any other party tell you that a green recovery is not possible and that it's either or. Um, the Labour Party wants to achieve this by reducing our CO2 emissions with 55%. And we do that by making sure that big emitters, big carbon, uh, carbon emitters, actually their fair share uh, of taxes. And we do that in a European way in order to make sure that we don't create a waterbed effect and that companies just simply move along within the European Union. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that we invest in sustainable energy and make sure that um, fossil fuels are phased out and in the case of coal, that they're being phased out immediately. Uh, thirdly is invest in mobility uh, to make sure that we do not use the plane anymore to go for maybe 20, 30 euros to the south of Spain for a couple of days and then fly back again. Uh, but instead invest in our trains, invest in our public transport. And fourthly and finally, we invest in agriculture, sustainable agriculture, um, which is not as intensive as it is now. That also means that we reduce our livestock, um, which is extremely important in order for us to keep this earth safe and to make sure that this climate emergency uh, is reversed. Thank you. Right. Right then, last but certainly not least, uh, I would like to give the floor to Volt uh, to share their position on this statement. Yes, thanks and good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I completely agree with the previous speakers. Uh, the statement shows a false contradiction. And I think that the most important uh, thing to add is that um, our focus point should be innovation and to have a clear vision of where we want to be as a society in 20, 30, 40 years. 
uh, today the, the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, uh, KNMI, showed that uh, currently we're not uh, reaching our goals as were agreed upon on the Paris Accords. That means that uh, we have a really, really serious problem. Um, and we need to focus on innovation and, and look how we can fix this. How can we ensure that in 2030, 2040, uh, we can prevent uh, a world of completely blowing up and reduce this, the CO2 emissions uh, that we uh, currently have. Um, so yeah, we in Volt, we believe we should look at this in a way to restructure our economy uh, in a way that uh, we put sustainability and innovation at the first place. And if we look at this statement, we can replace the word the Netherlands with Europe or the world. Uh, it's something that should be at the top of our minds uh, and it should be our main, fo main focus points in the next couple of years. So I'm also really happy to hear that the other um, participants here also agree that this is something that we should uh, focus on now. And uh, yeah, that th this th it's necessary that we have a long-term vision um, into and yeah, just see how we can fix this together. And it's something we can't do only in the Netherlands. We need Europe for this. We need the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, so I'm really happy to hear that everyone has this uh, on the top of their list. Right. Peter, if you allow me, um, if I would be a student right now listening, I would be like, okay, so there are four different parties. They all agree. This is boring. Uh, so not if you agree. Because uh, I think it sounds like in the words we find each other, and I, I know what I like about tonight is it's not a debate, but it's a conversation. But I think the way the plans we have and the choices and how important we make it and the commitment we have to it is very different. So I hope you come up with your questions and we can also show you the difference between the parties. Because it sounds like we all agree, but I think if we look more detailed, we don't. Exactly. I think with Senna, there are differences, but um, it's up to the students ask uh, the good questions so to incentivize it all right <laughs> well thank you very much um so yeah uh, as 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 i mentioned before uh, we will now we will open the floor to any questions or comments that people might have and you can do this either with the chat or um by raising your hand in the in the in the participant section um for um uh, yeah so i see one hand going up so i'm going to give the floor to artists uh to uh, ask this question uh, so go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you understand me well? Does that work? Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, well, thanks a lot first uh, for the great pitches. Uh, maybe diving into immediately the specifics, which I would see is uh, probably also the taxation of firms and attraction of international maybe headquarters. I mean, we see it now with Unilever uh, kind of being uh, between the Netherlands and uh, uh, the UK, I would say. Um, what is your perception on actually charging companies? Uh, should the proceed be on well saying if you don't want to pay then leave or should the attraction still be there to say we need to attract big conglomerates we need to keep the companies in the Netherlands to grow with them sustainably um, what is your take on that did you aim that towards a specific politician or should I give the word to I mean if there is a politician that would like to take uh, proceed on that otherwise it will be interesting to hear uh, Mr. Brickleman's uh, perception on that perhaps all right, then the floor to Mr. Bekelman. Yeah, so if I thank you, a very good question. And um, you mentioned two options, I, I think, and I would prefer the first one to do it with them uh, together. So I think when it comes to these companies, it's better to have, for example, the ETS system, European training system, to have something on a European level. So that for a company like Unilever or any other company, it doesn't matter if you have the same production and the same way of um, uh, you know, the same way of production in the Netherlands or any other European country. Because I think it would be, you know, really bad if companies leave here because they can. It's easier for them to pollute in another European country. Um, and I think we, as a party, maybe that's the difference between with some other parties. We are very realistic in that. We think that if we uh, Industries should um, reduce their CO2, CO2 emissions. We can charge them for that. We can increase taxation, uh, but let's do it. Let's try to do it as much as possible on the European level to make sure that they do not leave the Netherlands and pollute in another country. And I think that there are some other parties who want to go even further and say, let's you know, be more strict on them. Uh, but I see a big risk there. 
Thanks. Uh, you would like to respond, perhaps? All right, get the floor to the Labour Party. All right, we, we have to be honest about this. Um, it's also about, about political choices. I think the presence of multinational corporations in the Netherlands is highly important for our economy, but not at any costs. And that's where we differ from the very day. And also, if you talk about maybe spearheading this movement or um, maybe doing more other countries, in the European Council of December, there was an ironclad commitment from all member states to reduce their CO2 emissions uh, by 2030 with 55%. We have a climate law right now in place that goes as far as only 49%, which means that we're still 6% short. I think we can trust a part of countries negotiating in good faith when it comes to um, a European Council. So that means that the Netherlands falls short of its commitment. So it's not about doing more than other countries. It's about doing our fair share. So let this be clear. And also the very day, because of course they're afraid of the effects because in their, their manifesto, they talk about um, making sure that multinational corporations can still uh, sort of come to the Netherlands, all sort of tax breaks and tax incentives. And therefore they also have not submitted their manifesto to the planning bureau because of course they're afraid of what the conclusions might be of their manifesto. So let's be real, let's talk about the facts um, and not about frames. Right. Yeah, if I could extend on that, you might find it not surprising that I'll agree with my, my friend from the Labour Party. Um, and so, so not only, and Ruben, I like you as a person and I, I loved your opening statement. And that's one of the reasons why I said we should look at actions because not only did you not put your program into it, if you look at what we've agreed upon now and the, the actions that the current government is taking in, 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 in the calculation with the Central Planning Bureau, you're doing even less. So you're cutting even on the things we're doing. But beside that point, I want to go to the go back to the economics part because because I think there's also a false a falsehood in the argumentation we use. One of the things that I'm, well, we're very happy about is that the tax avoidance and the collective action problem of going lower and lower and lower on industry taxes is actually something when, within the OECD, uh, a lot of countries have now uh, stepped uh, stepped up and said this is something we don't want to. So when we hear the argument, this is good for business just having a postal office of Nike in the Netherlands is not creating jobs. So the idea that what we're doing is hurtful politics. So if you look at, for example, our tax initiative with the CO2, what we're saying is what we want to, and I, I think I can talk this language because you're all smart students and I think I can talk this language anytime because I always do it, is what we want to do is we want to price externality. So what we want to encourage is green business. What we don't want to encourage is the kind of businesses that put the pollution on society. At the end, that's going to hurt us all. And yes, Ruben then says there might be one business that's going to go away. But if you look at reality, what is the reason a lot of businesses decide to come here? It's because of the labor force, because of our international position. It has to do with a lot of different things. So it's kind of an argument that I, I want to be very strict on that often it's, it's, it's not true. And we, we're also seeing the hurt side of it because at the end of the day, only postal offices in the Netherlands, those are not the kind of business we want. We also wouldn't want to be the country because we're bungling in the back in Europe with only having polluting industry. What we want to do is incentivize. So all the money that we use in taxing, we send back in industry to incentivize the green uh, transition. Right. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Peter, can I maybe react yeah, to a few things? You can, because, uh, can reply to that. Uh, because I know that some parties want to make it a debate, like, like always. Um, um, so one, one thing maybe as a response to Kavis, because uh, he talks about central planning agency and about our program. Of course, we had our program uh, being um, assessed by our central planning agency. And what we see there is that if you look at the Labour Party's uh, program, that they put a 40 billion um, burden on our uh, private sector, on our companies, which is, you know, it's out of your mind if you look at the size of the Dutch economy. So, of course, it's going to have a huge impact on our companies and companies will leave and it will reduce the number of jobs. That's um, what we didn't do. And I'm, of course, I'm, I'm honest about it, is that if you look at our uh, planning agency that looks at the impact on the environment. Of course, we over the last four years, we put a lot of effort and it was our minister for economic affairs and climate who put a climate agreement for the entire country, uh, 
he created that with, with hundreds of stakeholders and it has a 49% reduction in CO2 in 2030. Of course, more needs to be done on top of that. I agree with, uh, with that. Uh, there must be, we have um, on a European level, we have the Green Deal. There will be a lot of measures on top of that because this is, there is this 55% agreement, uh, but they are not included in the models that are used. Second, the models only focus on 2030, and I think reaching the 2050 goal, that's what should be, um, we should focus on because we have a 95% target for 2050. That's all not included in the models. Also, for example, I'm, We'll mention it, nuclear energy, if you invest in it, it will only have benefits after 2030. That's all not included. So what we said, you know, is let's first make sure that we reach that 49% because a lot needs to be done. Then let's see on the European level what comes on top of it. But let's also look at what we need to do after 2030. And that's all not included in the models. So any uh, party that says, you know, we have a program to reach the 2050 goals, that's, you know, that's something that's still unsure. Thank you. Uh, mentioning European uh, cooperation, uh, let's give the floor to Itai to uh, follow up on that. Yeah, no, uh, the, the, I think the, the things Senna and Kavish mentioned, we uh, agree mostly, this, we think about it the same at Volt. Uh, what I do want to add is that we do believe in European taxation. So someone men mentioned that if we uh, put higher taxes in the Netherlands, people, the companies will flee to, to another European country. So we want to prevent that by using European taxation to, to tax uh, multinationals, tech companies, uh, in order to ensure that everyone pay their fair share of taxes. And the money that we earn with, with that, we can invest in uh, yeah, in sustainability, innovation, and to prevent uh, our world from uh, destruction. All right. All right, that's clear. Um, for, then for now, I'm going to give the floor to Casper, uh, who has his hand raised, uh, to ask the following question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, to follow up on one of the things Mr. Brekelman said, um, he mentioned uh, nuclear energy. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, GroenLinks and Volt uh, both have the environment pretty high. Um, but Volt is um, for nuclear energy and uh, GroenLinks is against it and uh, I was wondering what the reasons for this are because they both uh, believe in a more uh, better environment. Yeah so it's for us it's a bit more nuanced. Um, we are not against nuclear energy we say we should um, research nuclear energy to see if it can help us reach our climate goals because what we currently see as I mentioned before, today there was another research published that we're not uh, achieving our climate goals. And we believe that's the most important thing that we should be focused on. Uh, so in order for that to happen, we wanna discover different possibilities uh, to reduce our CO2 emissions. And one of them is nuclear energy. Um, so I think the big difference between us and, and uh, Who Links is that uh, they ruled out definitely and we say we should uh, look at it as, an, as a viable option in order to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions. All right. Thanks for this question, Caspar. Uh, um, so for who links uh, for the Green Left, what's important for us, it's, it's, it has to do with priorities. So the priority, if we look at the climate crisis that's coming our way, action is needed now until 2030. So Ruben earlier in our debate <laughs> said, well, all the benefits later, but if we want to do something, the time we need under 2030 is very, very important. So the priorities of action you can take right now, because let's be honest, tomorrow there's not going to be a nuclear facility right now and then we have the energy. Because at this moment, there is no company that has a permit or has requested a permit for nuclear energy. So that is our priority. And we say there are all these options that we have, and uh, Ruben does not have them because he does not find it important. It's fine. Uh, it's a small joke. And I'll stop now, Ruben, but it's just too fun, um, uh, is, is that we say, these are all the things you can do. And those are the things we prioritize. So that's, that's the first thing. Then, then on, on the debate of nuclear energy. So one of the things that really, really gets me is every time I get a motion that talks about climate change, I'm forced to talk about nuclear energy. And we're not forced to talk about, about sun, about water, about, so, so all of a sudden the entire national debate is only about nuclear energy and all the other options, other parties are not forced to, to say something about what their ideas are. As you can hear a little bit of frustration. 
then I'll tell you about nuclear energy. But well, we believe, and then we have a principal stance in this, we see huge risks. We see huge risks in, in what do you do with, with the consequences? How do you do the transport? What do you do, uh, where, do you put, uh, where do you put the material? These are risks that we find very hard to calculate because this small part of material can blow up. These are things that we find very, very important and we've always taken an, 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 a very principled stand on it, but we're willing in a bigger picture to think about that. But given in the, prior, in the priorities that we need to take action anyway, tomorrow, yesterday, until 2030, and there are all these other options that are available, let's do them first, because we can. Okay, let's talk about it, but then also start the conversation about the priorities. What we don't like is doing nothing having a hypothetical debate about nuclear energy without even one company requesting a permit to start it. And then in the meantime, doing nothing. Can I, right. can I give a small reaction? If that, if that of course. Okay. Yeah. So I, I agree with Senator. I think it's a shame that the whole debate now uh, about climate change has become nuclear energy. You see uh, the media and all the parties are start started talking about it and uh, I completely agree. There are also other ways we should focus now in order to prevent from our CO2 um, emissions to raise and, and to, uh, yeah, we need to reduce them. Um, but I do, do think it's important. Currently, we're not achieving our climate goals. Uh, we're not achieving them big time. And that is why we need to, to put this, this research in nuclear energy to see how we can ensure that in a couple of years we can use nuclear energy and we can make it viable for companies to invest in them. Uh, so I think that's the big difference between us and uh, GroenLinks. Uh, and maybe one quick reaction from my side. So I, I don't say that we should wait until we settle the nuclear energy debate, uh, not at all. So we need solar, we need uh, wind energy, we need other, uh, innovative options as well, and we need to work on it hard. Um, what you what you see in reality, for example, when it comes to wind energy, um, we cannot, you know, place or uh, how do you say like like have have a whole country, a whole landscape full of windmills. That because maybe we con don't consider it to be a problem. But if you look on a more regional and local level, municipalities, cities, uh, they say you know there is no support for this. So what we are doing now on a regional level, they're making energy strategies, regional energy. And you see that there is a lot of resistance, even in areas where, uh, we saw this in the news, that's in a joke from my side, where a majority of people is voting green left, they are against having a windmill in the backyard. So um, it's not so easy for us as national politicians, it's easy to say, you know, let's put windmills everywhere. But, but Ruben, just one quick question, because listen to this conversation. I said, nuclear energy consequences, explosion, right? kind of heavy, oh, not in my backyard kind of problems, which exists also in towns where we rule. But those things are not equal, you know? And you're putting them as like, oh, people don't like a windmill in their garden, let's put nuclear energy here. I think we should have that conversation in a different way. Yeah, so I, I think this you're making a bit of a character in this way about it. That's not what I mentioned. I mentioned that we want to reach those goals that we all consider to be important. And you cannot reach those goals realistically with only wind and only solar energy. So you need to look at other options as well. Um, and I agree that it takes a long time to have a nuclear facility, to do it uh, also in a way that is supported by people living around those areas and to go through all the necessary steps. So if we wait with this discussion until 2030 or whatever, we are definitely too late. So that's why there is now a lot of focus on it right now, because if we want to have a nuclear facility uh, way before 2050 in order to make this contribution to the goals that we are all considered to be important, we also need to act now, just like we need to act on wind, solar, and all other forms of energy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'll maybe give the floor to the Labour Party to hear what their stance would be on um, goals to reach these, uh, ways to reach these goals. No, I mean, I agree with Ruben that we need to be pragmatic, but let's also face the facts. I mean, nuclear power is not going to help us reduce our carbon emissions on the very, near the very short term, which is extremely important to make sure that climate change doesn't become an irreversible thing. Before we have a nuclear power plant operational, it takes 15 years. It takes at least 3 billion investment. No private party is willing to foot the bill. So I think it's a purely hypothetical discussion and I agree with Green Left. It's a good way to sidestep that we need to have real action 
um, in order to reduce our carbon emissions and make sure that we go towards a more sustainable energy mix. I think also what is very important, I mean, we're almost exactly to this very day, 10 years ago, we had the Fukushima disaster in Japan. And I think nuclear energy, the risks involved, let's also have an honest debate about that because it's not risk free. Um, and as long as we still have the nuclear waste, which has a half-life of 10,000 years, 10,000 of years, and we do not have like a proper solution for it to store it in a very sustainable way, um, the risks involved indeed, as Senna rightly points out, um, of actually having a nuclear power plant in your backyard or windmill, that's quite a different thing. Um, so if we want to have an honest debate about nuclear power, sure, but first and foremost, it's not going to help us solve the climate issue. And second of all, let's also have an honest debate then about the risks involved. Right, well, thank you very much. Uh, and indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue that we probably won't be finding a consensus on uh, during this discussion. Therefore, um, would like to, um, or was there yeah. something you wanted to add on? No, so yeah, so maybe we, of course we we can go on, on on this topic for a long time, and, and maybe we shouldn't do this. But uh, let, let's make it very clear. I agree for 2030 goals. It doesn't help. Eh? Be honest. But I think we also need to look at 2050, not because we need to wait, but because we want to reach both goals, 2030 and 50. And we and that's and that's a difference in opinion, of course. Um, the risk with nuclear energy are extremely low, and to such a low level, especially when you look at the you know, current generation of nuclear facilities. We already have one up and running in Boston. Uh, of course, it has the highest security standards you can think of. So we think that it can be done in a safe way, like many countries are doing it, like we are doing it in Boston. Um, and yeah, we, we think it should be included in our overall plans. All right. And if I can just add one little thing, I think it's a bit exaggeration to talk about exploding. Uh, yeah. Uh, nuclear plants and that kind of stuff um, and I agree it's, it's with Ruben it's not relevant for 2030 but I think the, the whole story especially Kavish was making uh, it just put more emphasis that we need to do more invest more in research and in, in innovation um, to find a way how nuclear energy can help us actually reach our climate goals because with the things we're doing now it's not enough uh, so, so uh, yeah I believe it's a viable option that we should discuss, do research on. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry guys for being too dramatic. I've been Zooming all day, so I was trying to make it a little bit of fun for myself. <laughs> well, same, uh, but that seemed to uh, have raised a lot of hands, actually. So um, I'm going to um, recognize one more hand for this uh, topic of sustainability before moving into uh, the national security part. So I'm going to give the floor to Janneke, uh, who raised her hand first. Um, so please, Janneke, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, thank you all for the uh, elaborate, uh, elaborative answer on the nuclear uh, power. I think this is the topic that has been coming along over and over again in the debates considering sustainability. Um, therefore, my question is a bit different and it concerns the balance between um, individual actions and initiatives with regards to uh, sustainability um, versus collective, more governmental oriented uh, actions. And I was wondering um, how you see this balance and how you want to uh, stimulate both of whether and if so, uh, how you want to stimulate both. All right, well, I'll give this question to, um, to, to Kunlings or Itai is muting, uh, muting himself. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, no, really, really good question. Um, wh what I really like about the last couple of years is when it comes to individual action, you see like in elementary and also in high schools, children are busy with climate change and you see like that they come up with organizations and it's something they're really active in also in the, the climate march that's coming up. And that's something when I was a child, it wasn't there. Uh, so you see there's much more general awareness uh, for individuals to, to, to they, they see the problem and they know they should act upon it. Uh, and, and I'm, yeah, I, I think that we should do everything in our power, especially it's our, responsi our responsibility as politicians to guide the society to making the right decisions and ensuring they see climate change as the number one priority. Um, with regarding to uh, like, yeah, like looking more at companies or the industries, I think we're not doing uh, enough 
um, as we could hear could hear in the previous discussion. I think there's so much more that we can do. Uh, yeah, and of course, with Volt, we look on European level on taxation and forcing companies to uh, make like make sustainable decisions. Also, now you saw the government is helping like uh, the biggest national airline in the Netherlands, um, and they barely need to do anything for it. And uh, yeah, th these are things we really need to uh, to focus on as politicians, I think, in uh, in the coming four or five years. Yeah, I fully fully agree with Itai and, and with Volt. And um, in Dutch, you have this saying that says, uh, a good climate starts with yourself. And um, I don't think that's a proper translation, but something in those lines. And I think it's the biggest illusion we've had as if as long, and I think it's good, right? It's good that we're not using plastic. I think it's good, everything we can do, we should do. But the idea that that is what's needed to tackle this collective action problem. And earlier in the statement, I said, what we're now doing is not only subsidizing, like Itai said, but we're actually making it very attractive to, to pollute and to, 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 to be an effective industry without being green. That's, that's, these are the incentives that we're giving. That's something you only can tackle with collective action, prob, uh, collective action and therefore with both on the European level and on the national level, uh, the, needed, um, uh, the needed measures. And one of the things that I find very important, and I hope Itai agrees with this as well, is that we're very happy with the ambition we're showing in, in Europe. And we're very happy with the agreements we make there. But we believe that that we as the Netherlands, we, we should show some leadership within Europe, but also not use the European decision-making as an excuse to say, so we don't have to do anything nationally anymore. Uh, so, and this is, this is why I'm so happy that Volt is now in, in all these debates, because you see there's a European, European dimension in every motion or ev every topic we talk about, uh, but only saying, well, we're gonna solve it in Europe and then not talk about what you can do nationally, I think is not enough. Uh, as Volt shows by participating in national elections, right? Uh, so uh, that's what I would say, which doesn't mean that I don't think we shouldn't like stop, like as an, on an individual level, we should do as we can do. But at the end of the day, we have to decide collectively to, to stop it. Exactly. All right. Well, um, then I'm going to use that, um, that, that argument as a segue into uh, the next uh, topic, which also... Um, which also often comes to this um, dichotomy between the national and the collective responsibility, which is, of course, national security, uh, which is one of the other uh, topics that we wanted to cover uh, tonight. So just like the previous round, uh, we will start with opening statements, uh, opening pitches by every politician uh, of two minutes. And afterwards, we will open the floor to questions uh, from the audience again regarding this topic. Um, so I shared a, uh, well, not really a statement, but a question beforehand uh, with uh, uh, with the politicians, which uh, is as follows. Considering the current security environment in which the Netherlands finds itself with, for example, a surge in terrorism across Europe, several anti-establishment movements, along with organized criminality and finally Russian and Chinese assertiveness, what do you believe are the most pressing national security threats for the Netherlands and how would your party address it? So I'm gonna start with, um, with Mr. Brekelmans if he wants to open this up for the baby day. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, so I, I think it's, you mentioned a few security threats and I, I think three of them, but they're all important, but let me mention three. I think physically, of course, terrorism is very important because that you know can come very close if a terrorist attack happens and there is a risk uh, of that happening in the Netherlands and we have seen that before. So we should do everything in order to prevent that. Uh, second, a more traditional threat, I would say comes from Russia, which of course, taking a very aggressive stance towards Europe, also at the eastern uh, border of Europe. So we should be able to defend ourselves against that threat. Uh, and third, uh, you mentioned China. Uh, China is, of course, physically it's it different, but in cyberspace, uh, they impose a very large threat. There are cyber attacks on a daily basis. If you talk to intelligence officials, we only know a very limited amount of what's happening on a daily basis. Um, so that's also something we should defend ourselves against. Also, when it comes to uh, how China tries to influence decision making within Europe by having alliances with some countries, investing in our vital infrastructure to make countries dependent on China. I think that those are all things that we need to defend ourselves uh, against. Um, two things in terms of solutions. Uh, one is that I think we should collaborate more on the European level. 
uh, because as a small country like the Netherlands, of course, it's very hard to do something geopolitically in the world because we are just a small player. So if we can act together on a European level against Russia, against China, we stand much stronger. And we think if it comes to human rights violations and um, imposing sanctions, then those decisions shouldn't be made by on a, a uni unanimity uh, base, but on a qualified majority. Uh, and second, uh, we should invest much more in our defense uh, and in our military. Uh, we, as the VVD, of, out of all parties, invest most, most in it because we think that within NATO, as Europe, we should make a bigger contribution. And we, as the Netherlands, also should contribute much more to our own security and our collective security. So that's why we invest the most out of any party in, the, in, the, in our military. All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, I heard a uh, European cooperation, so that naturally uh, bridges to uh, Itai to uh, give his perspective from uh, Volt. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I agree with most uh, points Ruben mentioned. Uh, as you also said before, I'm a, I'm a cyber uh, strategy consultant, and one I one things I do is I'm a cyber threat intel analyst. So I um, look for clients who who is threatening them and what kind of cyber threats, and a lot of the threats are coming from. Russia or China or North Korea. Uh, so I acknowledge that the threats are there and especially in, in cyber. And we need to deal with them much more effectively and in using European cooperation is, is the way to deal with this. Um, but I think the biggest threat to our national security is not mentioned in this statement. And this is the uh, whole um, anti-democracy movements and anti-democratic political parties. Um, this whole term of alternative facts almost makes me puke when I hear it. These are politicians and people and organizations that uh, show distrust in, in our uh, like most sacred institutions. And um, I think what I see currently happening in society and, and that's what scares me. And that's also, I think one of the reason that fault was, was uh, yeah, we, we were created after the Brexit. And for us, Brexit was like a wake up call of like, well, if, if populist, populism can rise as, as big as this and, and put people, um, push people into to making really, really bad decisions uh, based on lies and false facts, uh, then we have a big problem in our democracy. And that was why Fold was founded throughout all of Europe. And that's why I see the biggest threat is the populist movements uh, and political parties who are also now participating in the Dutch elections that have proposals that are against our, our own constitutions and put people, uh, treat people like crap and are, are preventing us from, from having dialogue with each other and getting to actually sustainable solutions with each other. And they do this throughout all of Europe. You see all these populist movement rising. So I think these are the, the most uh, pressing national security threat for us. Um, and in addition to that, I agree with Ruben, we should invest more in our military, especially on European level. Uh, so one of our proposals is also to eventually create a European army. Um, that's something in the future. Uh, we should invest more in NATO, uh, at least to reach the 2% that, ever, that is expected from us. Um, but yeah, so, so for, like, for the, the most, I think, biggest security threat for us is the populist and anti-democratic movements. Right. Well, then um, I would like to give the floor to Kavish to uh, give there. Um, opening on this topic. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, it's, a, it's a very complex issue. So let me try to unpack this here. Um, it's, a, it's a very great question, very pertinent as well. So internal and external security are in, inextricably linked uh, these days. So what that means is, first of all, for our internal security, we need to heal the divisions at home. Um, that does not only relate to anti-democratic movements, but also um, kids may be frustrated growing up in certain areas of our country. Why do they decide to join a terrorist organization? That also means why do they, for example, decide to join uh, gangs or go into organized crime? That also means investing much in our police force, especially in community policing, to make sure we keep our eyes and ears out um, for people who actually live in these neighborhoods. We need to in invest in these areas and make sure that people feel at home, people are not marginalized. Um, make sure that people have their place in society, which also means actually 
getting at institutional racism and discrimination within our society. If we look at, look at the external environment, um, then we see a variety of threats. I mean, Russia was already rightfully mentioned. We have China. We have, of course, uh, the Middle East. Um, we need to be very clear about this and also make a certain distinction. Russia is a direct military threat to uh, both Europe and the Netherlands when it comes to our direct security. So that means investing more in NATO, investing more in our hard defense, and ensuring that we can deter the Russian aggression, which is happening right now on our borders. When it comes to the Middle East, part of actually dealing with the problems in the Middle East also links already to healing the divisions at home, making sure everyone feels comfortable within our own society, and making sure that we do not add fuel to the fire in already a conflict-ridden place. Um, and when it comes to finally China, uh, the country which I have spent like the past two years of my life in, China is a very complex challenge and arguably the biggest geopolitical challenge of our century. Um, it's a country with 1.4 billion people, uh, the second largest economy in the world, and soon to be the world's largest. Um, and working together with China is not a luxury. It's a pure necessity if we want to deal with the challenges of our time, such as uh, a pandemic or climate change. But that also means that we need to be very clear about where we do want to work together with China or we don't. China is both a partner and competitor when it comes to the economic domain and a systemic rival. Um, if we look at national security, if we look at undermining our democracy and our institutions, multilateral, multilateralism. So that means that we need to have a very clear strategy in which we do that. So it's a complex issue and I'm very much looking forward to your questions to delve deeper into this. Thank you. All right. And then uh, Sana from the position of Kunlings. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for this topic. And thanks everyone in the panel, because I think a lot of wise things have been said. And one of the things that, that I believe that, that defines our time is that the classic way of looking at national security and threats in, in which you departmentalize, this is a defense threat, this is an intelligence threat, this is a no longer work. So what we're seeing is complexities. And I, I think Itai, Kavizhi, and also Ruben mentioned this. If we look at the Russian threat, it's both we are dependent in terms of gas, you have undermining of our democratic processes through fake news. At the same time, you have a security threat. So all these things are happening at the same time. And I think one of the things that's very needed and, and is also why we, for example, invest in, in our intelligence is that we no longer look at these threats from all these different perspectives, but have a multidimensional approach. So we see it, for example, in the econo economic domain, when in, in the South of the Netherlands, uh, a field of land is picked up for a company to build something there could be a security threat there going on as well. And that, that is something that's in the economic domain, but has a huge uh, security dimension as well. And we, we think it's very important. And I think the, the second thing I wanted to mention is, and, and I fully agree with my colleagues, is that we love our small country, but we're small. So geopolitically, we're dependent on Europe. And it's also time to, to grow up geopolitically. So if, if I look at the debates, and, and this is one of the reasons why I was so happy to join tonight, um, I don't know whether you've been following the Dutch elections, but sometimes it, it really feels like we're that small island as if no one else exists and we're all alone and we only talk about the things that matter to us. I see, I should stop talking the fault line, Itai. This is, uh, this is something's going wrong right here. Uh, but this is really, I think also, and I, that's why I'm exci excited for this panel and also what Kofi said, we should force national politicians to be open about this and to not speak to, 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 to us as people, to our mouths, because I think at the end of the day, we're a small country within Europe, we need to collectively act and geopolitically, uh, we really are dependent. So uh, we should work together. All right. Well, many uh, important things have been raised already. Um, I see a few hands are being raised. So I'm gonna give the floor to Emily uh, so you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, yeah, so I have a question regarding more the internal security threats that I think were mostly mentioned by Volt. So I agree with that populism and the whole anti-democracy movement is a massive issue. And we've obviously seen it in the US, how serious the consequences can be with what happened in the capital. So I agree that it's a large issue, but I was wondering what you think is actually the approach to tackle that. Yeah, really good question. And I don't think uh, one of us has the, found the, the ultimate solution for this. I think 
two two things for me are really important. First of first of all, it's it's dialogue. We need to keep talking with each other and make each other understand one another and understand where these frustration comes from. Kavish made a good point that sometimes people are for some reasons are attracted to certain movements or to certain ideas. We need to discover what those are and talk about it and, and try to find solutions for it. That, that's the best solution um, that there is. Second thing, I think we shouldn't be afraid of these movements. We should call them out and, and call them by their name. If it's anti-democratic, if it's populist, if they're lying, we should say that they're lying uh, and not be afraid of that. Uh, and sometimes th that was one of the reasons I was attracted to Fold. I see sometimes people are like afraid of, of, of um, I don't know, yeah, of judging them or coming into conflict with one another. And like when something's wrong, it's wrong and we should call it out and do something about it instead of being afraid for it. Um, and that's something I miss, miss a lot in politicians currently. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think th those two things are the most important. So dialogue and, and calling something wrong when you see it. Thank you. All right. Um, see a few more hands. <laughs> Can, yeah. can I make just really open for discussion? Because I think it's a, it's a very tough question uh, for, for any party. Also for my party, uh, we have seen over the past many people going from, in all honesty, from the VVD to populist parties. And uh, they are not coming back because they lost trust in uh, politics in general. And, they, and they, so, uh, of course, I agree that we should have a dialogue and everything but it's very hard to have a dialogue if if people do not have trust in politicians anymore um so i think one thing that i um want to mention is that um as an example we were in favor we are in favor of free trade uh, as the vvd we think that you know open economy and everything is very important but we see that there can be negative consequences for people losing their jobs because of free trade um and we see that because of that, of course, uh, for example, in the US, there was a big reason why people supported Donald Trump, because they thought that he wouldn't have uh, jobs being shipped overseas because of, you know, he was a protectionist. Um, and that made us uh, rethink and also think about free trade, you know, we should also take into account how it impacts and affects large groups in our society. Uh, and maybe, you know, think about when you make a trade agreement, somehow take that into account. And, and how we think about trade in our, in my uh, party, at least, it's still going on, right? What's what's then the new way of thinking about trade? Um, we had a discussion about the environment and about uh, our climate goals. There's something similar there because there are many in populist parties they are denying climate change, and if we only push harder and harder and harder, resistance is also increasing. So you, whatever you do when it comes to climate, we should also take into account: is there enough support for this and isn't there like a big counter response by other people and then you know you get even a larger group that is denying climate which of course is something we all uh, dislike so i think dialogue is one thing of course uh, but let's also think about you know let's make sure that we do not just say let's have a dialogue but also think about you know, on these big topics that are important to us how can we make sure that there is enough support and that we are not losing people because once we lose them to a populist movement, it's very hard to make them come back. Thanks, Ruben, for that. This was, um, and, and thank you also for this question, Emily, because I think, I honestly think this is a really big question of our time. And I'm not saying it just for the funds, but I really, I've been talking to a lot of American friends, uh, people elsewhere, what are the mechanisms that we're seeing and what can we do about it? So we're not fully understanding. And thanks, Ruben, also about being so open about the choices you have within a party and also in the political context. Uh, I don't have an answer. And I think uh, uh, everyone said that. For me, a couple of things are, uh, it's, it's a rule of thumb and I'm gonna be very open about it because it's also a question I ask myself, given that we're all young people stepping into a political arena, how are you going to do with this? Besides, is there an answer for politics? So what, what, what Idai said, there are certain norms that you always wanna keep there. So, so you wanna speak up and say, this is not okay. Uh, so you want, want to have your, whether it's through your law enforcement, whether it's to, to speaking out the norm, to not normalize certain kinds of behavior. And I think this is something if we look back that we, and, and you have to do it in a way where, where, you're, where you're understanding and that you want to understand where people come from. But, but, but often we've let that norm slide until it comes to an arena where we're like, we don't like this anymore. The second, and I fully agree with Ruben, what's going on? Why are there so many people that feel 
misrepresented. And especially if I look in the States, people were surprised or remember the elections with Donald Trump. Like the Democrats missed this huge thing that was going on. And I think we should, as politicians and political parties, look at ourselves, what are we doing wrong? Why for so many people that if, if they think about politics, they feel misrepresented, they don't trust it. And that leads to this huge lack of trust in institutions. And one of the last things, and the, the, the last thing that I've been thinking, a lot, uh, thinking about a lot lately is, uh, we've talked about this information age. Well, we're now sitting together in this Zoom link with people that I've not met before. Um, I think that the skill of critical thinking, of observing information and knowing what's true and not true in the overload of information is one of the most crucial skills that you're going to need in the 21st century, that we need to invest young people having those skills. Um, and we should not, and, and this is going to sound, and, and, and maybe Kavish is going to say something about this, societies are more than a bunch of individuals. So the collectiveness that we used to have in certain institutions, whether it was the church or whether it was your street or your small village that led to a certain connectedness that also had mechanisms in them that were suppressing that I don't like. So it's good that we got rid of those, um, but also had mechanisms in them that led to openness, communication. And we are a very individualized society. So what we see now is, and I think Avish said it nicely, whether it's an individual radicalization, whether it's you start with asking a critical question and then you get into, uh, in, into conspiracy theory and you, you get lost. There, there, is, there is a lack of, of, of community in there where whether there is a mechanism to stop it. And this is something as a human, has nothing to do with politics, as a human, I very much worry about. Uh, and I don't have the answer. So maybe instead of only questions, maybe people have some solutions for us young politicians that we can take up uh, uh, on our journey. Yes, I might say something about this as well. It's, it's an extremely good and tough question. Uh, and in that sense, I also find it a, a shame that we cannot go door to door campaigning because I did that during the previous general election. And of course, then you also meet a lot of uh, people who vote Freedom Party or other populist parties. Um, and these were also always the most difficult, but also the most interesting conversations you had about politics, because almost without exception, these were people who initially were at some point in their life had voted Labour Party, uh, or perhaps another big, big people's party, like, for example, the Veve Day. Uh, but they felt disenfranchised. And the, the real issue, of course, was why did they do that? And I, I ask them all the time, all right, you, Geert Wilder says all kinds of horrible things about people, including me because of the way I look and because of my background, um, about me. What, what do you think of that? And then basically what almost everyone said, like, I'm, I'm not racist and I do not necessarily agree with everything he says and I think his tone is a bit crude but I have the sense that I'm not being heard that my voice is not being represented in the house of parliament and he gives a voice to my anger about institutions and I think that's something we should definitely bear in mind and I, it's something that genuinely worries me because if we look at society these days I think Senna said it fantastically we see divisions everywhere we see an increasing gap between people that are highly educated, like you and me. Uh, basically, we have uh, fixed jobs. We can buy a home probably in our lifetime, although it's getting increasingly difficult, and a lot of people who don't have that. Um, and then, of course, on top of that economic security, there's also the more cultural dimension, I think. Who am I? Where do I belong within this society? Um, I think the sense of cohesion, the, the, I would call it a social pact, it is what the Labour Party was initially founded for. Um, and I still believe in that, but I think it's a tremendous, tremendous challenge because you see that all the people that initially voted for us and believed in that promise have gone away. Um, and it's, I don't have a silver bullet like no one here in this room, if only. Uh, but I think it's it's constantly something you should be mindful of. And I think it's indeed both dialogue, make sure that people's voices are being heard, but also let's seriously talk about policy. I think Karima said it perfectly. Uh, we also need to talk about the downsides of free trade. Uh, we also need to talk about the downsides of certain economic policy that might not have helped everyone in this society. So in that sense, 
I think for all of us here as young politicians, it's a tremendous, tremendous challenge. Um, but it is my motivation to, to sort of make a contribution, at least. I don't have the, 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 the illusion that I, I'm the only one that can solve it, but uh, to at least make a contribution and sort of try to heal these divisions um, and be mindful of it. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to give the floor to Munya, who has her hand raised. Um, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Um, so first of all, thank you to uh, the panelists, obviously, for taking out the time for, to do this. Uh, debate so far has been very interesting. Um, so I want to link to things. Um, first thing is, I think, what uh, Senna said about um, a lack of trust in the government. Um, and then something that Itai from Vault said, which is dialogue. And I think uh, Ruben said that as well. So. Um, basically, in our society, we have a group of people that's being consistently ostracized and isolated um, from the debate. And uh, we have a very, um, the political landscape is very white, the academic landscape is very white as well. Um, same for the business landscape. And so when we need to tackle issues um, such as a lack of trust in the government, which I think personally is one of the biggest reasons for um, a lack of security and national security um, and a threat to national security. How are you going to approach the issue of dialogue? Because I think that's a very easy answer to a very complex and layered issue. Um, so my question is, how are you going to include people in that dialogue? Right, well then, I'm I'm going to give the floor to uh, Itai to start off with this uh, question. Yeah, very good question. Um, so, so I didn't say dialogue because I, th I thought it was an easy answer because I think actually facil facilitating dialogue is one of the most difficult things we can do, especially with groups who are standing way like very far from each other. Um, so, so, so I thought about it a bit and I think first of all when I say dialogue i think it's it's the responsibility of the whole society it's not only us as politicians but i think it's everyone's responsibility also on this call uh, to try and understand uh, one another i think that's the whole basic uh, way of how our democracy should work and that's something that's missing especially when you look on social media now i started to be becoming much, much more active because i'm trying to become a politician um th the way people discuss sometimes there's no nuance in the debate and it's all really negative story and a lot of people talk about fear and uh and that's a really a shame and i think we as politicians do have the responsibility to um put more effort into into this debate and try to actually come with actionable solutions based on a nuance and a positive story and i think that's also something that attracts a lot of people to vote and and i think a lot of more political parties sh should uh should have this story and if I have to, to, to propose a concrete action, so one, one of the things I like uh, is the citizens' assemblies. Uh, we also have it in our election program. And that's a way uh, to facilitate dialogue between different groups in society and to ensure people that never see each other or never talk to each other are put in the same room and discuss a topic that's important to them and that's important to society. And that is also a way for, I think, government institutions to find out what do actually people think about our proposals, how we can ensure that people actually support our proposals. Um, and this is, I think, the, the, the best way I see in the future to facilitate dialogue between different, different groups in society. And it also is a way, like Ruben mentioned, to ensure that people actually support uh, government policy or understand government policy and understand the, their decision making. All right, thank you. I think uh, Kavish's internet just cut out, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's fine. I'm going to give the floor to Ruben uh, to, to respond as well. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's a very difficult topic. So, um, um, like, take, take, we, we talked about sustainability and the environment. Eh? Um, so, on the one hand, we say super important, let's reach those goals 95% windmills everywhere. What if we talk to people and people uh, and we have assemblies and everything and people say, I don't want a windmill in my backyard in general. 
it's a difficult situation, right? Because on the one hand, you want you can try to convince people, and you can. Uh, I, I worked in, in in migration and asylum for two for three years, and that was it's also a very sensitive topic, of course. And there were many politician politicians on a national level saying, "Let's um, let's provide more shelter to more refugees in the Netherlands because we can do much more." And then I talk to mayors and to uh, local politicians, and they say to me, literally, you know, okay, my party can say it on a national level, but I don't want an, a refugee center in my um, in my village or in my town because there is too much resistance against it. Um, so it, it, it's it's very difficult because on the one hand, on a national level, you you want to do certain things, but then on a local level, people say, do "Not have it in my backyard." And if you push through, then it creates resistance. And if you don't do it, then we do not reach those goals that are, um, and I'm not sure whether an assembly or things like that, whether that really makes a difference because uh, there are already in, in everything we do, there is a lot of opportunity for people to uh, take part in the discussion and to have a say in it and to go to uh, your uh, local council or, or everything. So um, I think in the end, you know, people have trust in government if we, understand what is important for people and if we deliver on what we promise. Um, and what, what you saw over the last year, because we were in a crisis situation, crisis situation that actually uh, trust in government was going up. And that's something you often see because to some degree people felt that, you know, uh, the government is trying its best to solve this solution and they take our concerns seriously. And I think that's also a role that we as individual members of parliament have. So for us as VVD, we also thought, you know, especially our members of parliament, I, I'm not in parliament yet, but that's what, what I saw my, my colleagues doing, uh, saying, you know, we don't have all the debates. We cannot function as a parliament at this time. The, our, uh, the, the cabinet, uh, the, the government is in, in charge now of solving the crisis and, and our role is, um, you know, as we always do to, to uh, to watch that closely but you know it's now first the government needs to take action so what is our role then and our members of parliament took a lot of time in talking to entrepreneurs to students to everyone who wanted to have their voice heard to make sure that there is a member of parliament you can speak to and you can you know discuss your concerns with and i'm sure that other parties did it as well so um just to to summarize i think it's very tough but we as individual members of parliament can, can play an important role in that all right, Sana, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> thanks for your uh, question, Munya, and thanks for the others also for uh, their elaboration. Um, this is a very important one for me. As, 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 as Peter said in the introduction, I used to be a civil servant working as an economic advisor to Treasury and, and the social affairs before, and the phase in which I'm doing the campaign now was also the phase in which we had this huge scandal in Dutch politics. I don't know whether everyone is aware of the Tuschlag affair. And for me, that one really hit home because you know, person, people individually, because I used to work for all the people that were at all these hearings. Th those were my bosses. These were my colleagues. We were responsible. You look back at the 10 years, I thought the report was very good and it's an analysis that everyone failed. Everyone failed. We all had a role in it. So I was happy when Ruben said, with the promises and the role of politicians, like reflection on ourselves as well, both on civil servants, both on, 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 on the, uh, the legal system. And it's in that context that I've been thinking about, so what is government actually? And I know this sound, might sound big, but for me this is important because we tend to talk about government as an entity that's different from ourselves. But if I go back to what I think that government is, at the end it is the collective action that we would make together, would stand together in a, in a town hall and say, this is what we're going to do. But then we're too busy with our lives. So in the Netherlands, we say 150 people, you represent us. And, uh, and then every time it's, it's a different 150 people. So for me, to, to keep thinking of government that way and not as an entity that's different from people. And, and this, this, might, this is not only words, for me, that's very fundamental. And, and, and that is, so if I then look at what, what we've been doing and if I look at my time as a, as a civil servant, uh, so one of the issues that I find very important is that you have like, always have a diverse workforce. So you have all these uh, different voices that are heard within different institutions. But then we've, we've, we started thinking of institutions as if they're, they're separate entity of the people. And I think that is a really, really big problem. Uh, because what you then have is also, we start talking to, 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 to people as, as consumers. 
instead of, and this is why, and we don't have this in, in our program, and, and I'm going to be honest about it, um, in, in, in Ireland, for example, what they did with abortion, huge clash between different norms, religion, uh, uh, disagreement about abortion. They selected 100 people. And what they did is they said, this is the dilemma. And not only to, to pitch in in an evening, to, to give your idea, to have like a Zoom call, to do the little thing and then continue, but to say, you are the 100 people that are going to talk about this. You're going to take the responsibility and make this decision for everyone else. And my feeling is, and what happened, those 100, 100 people that were selected started to have deep conversation, started to research the topic, still kept their beliefs, were part of the solution, uh, had all the space to say and were respected. And if you, in that realm, have conversation and decision making, I think you get different kind of decision making. And I'm saying this because maybe Fultz's idea about uh, uh, in their program is an interesting way. But for me, I think looking at parliament that way, I'm not only a representative and, and government lose of the people, but we are a selection of 150 people that are the people. And I, I need to keep saying this to myself because I think this is part of the problem. We've, we started to see in government as like, as if I'm going to Netflix and getting my thing, and then I'm, I'm not happy with it and I'm gonna, I wanna have a next government. But at the end of the day, we have nothing else. We are the bunch of people doing it together. And that's why I, I started and I'll end now, Peter, because I'm, I'm going through my time but I was talking and thinking at the same time, which you should never do, um, is, is, th is that we as politicians and political parties have to really look at ourselves because we are also, also part of this problem. So hopefully also part of the solution. Kavish is back, so maybe he wants to say something. <laughs> All right, in the meantime, I also want to say that I'm gonna give the floor to Arles in a bit uh, to ask this question, but also to all your participants, if you have any other questions non-related to national security right now, you can also uh, raise your hand just for any questions uh, that you might have because my time management skills could, could have some improvement. Uh, <laughs> but for now, I'm just gonna give the floor to Artis uh, and then uh, you can ask his question. Excellent, uh, th thank you so much. I had a question and kind of that dates back to what we talked about when we were on national security in Europe and should be European army or a Dutch army uh, or both. Um, it probably is a new topic to start talking about the role of Europe, uh, looking at Brexit or maybe you know, different economic uh, developments. Um, but nevertheless, I would like to throw it out there. Um, you can take it from any perspective we want, uh, but how do you see the future of Europe? Um, do you see the future as uh, further melting together, such as developing a uh, one army uh, potentially, or do you see it more as we need to think about ourselves a bit, get our, ourselves stronger, possibly the Southern part of Europe a bit stronger uh, and then act strong together? What are your takes on that? All right, thank you for that question uh, on European security uh, cooperation. And when I heard this uh, being mentioned by Itai a bit while back, I saw a strong reaction as well from uh, Ruben. So maybe uh, starting with Itai and then give it to Ruben afterwards to uh, elaborate on this. Yeah, so we at full we definitely uh, believe uh, that we should delve more into together um, in Europe. I think for the main reason is because like the biggest challenges our society is facing today, if it's climate change, um, security, migration, social inequality, the solution lies in Europe. Uh, if we are not cooperating with each other, we cannot fix these challenges. We're completely dependent on one another in Europe also. Um, so yeah, I see our, our future is, is made in Europe and, and uh, it's also our slogan, by the way. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, like, like I said before, the, the, the solutions for the biggest challenges in the society that we are facing can only be found in Europe and through European cooperation. Uh, so I think that's essential to create like a sustainable future for, uh, for the Netherlands and for all other countries uh, in Europe. Ruben, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, so, so I, I think there are a number of topics that we should work on together on the European level. Uh, migration is one of them, also climate. Um, but when it comes to security, and that's why I was kind of um, uh, not nodding uh, earlier, is that I don't think we should have a European army. Uh, first, we, of course, need to define what a European army means. But if a European army means that then on a European level, it is decided whether we should have our Dutch women and men sent out on a military mission, I think that's not something that we should have because, uh, because it's such so fundamental huh, whether you want to put your, your people's life at risk in order to fight and, and, and defend us. 
I think that's something that should be decided on a national level. I think we will lose the support from a lot of people if that's done on a European level. Um, we talked a lot about uh, connection and engagement before, and there is an issue that people do not feel that connected to Europe as they do on a national level. So I think things that we can do better on a national level, we should you know, keep doing that. But there are some big topics that we should work on together. Um, and it, when it comes to defense, of course, there is potential for more collaboration. We do this also between countries on a, a bilateral level. So we work together with Germany, uh, still on a relatively small scale, because it turns out to be quite difficult on a more operational level. But I think there is a lot more potential there to do that. Uh, when it comes to innovation and research, we can do projects on a European level. Uh, but talking about the European army, um, that's, that's, you know, that's a bridge too far. We should not do that. Right, Kavish, uh, go ahead to respond on that. Yes, sorry, I lost my connection temporarily, but it's good to be back. Now, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question because I think it harks back to the discussions we had earlier about um, the divisions in society and people not feeling represented by politics. Um, and of course, I think the European Union is one of the most pertinent questions in that case. I mean, the Brexit all comes to mind, of course. Um, and I find it a, find it a, a tough one because I, I fully agree that the big challenges of our time, whether it's climate change, whether it's um, social economic inequality, um, they all should be done in Europe. Security also is a very good topic indeed. Uh, but the constant search towards finding people that are willing to go along with you to make sure that people feel represented in European institutions is one of the key challenges. So for example, if you look at economic cooperation, um, I think a lot of people are in favor of economic cooperation in Europe, but as we also discussed, there are certain downsides to cooperating within Europe or just having an internal market where companies can sort of go, uh, go about their way and the rights of employees are not uh, respected enough. Uh, the same goes for a European army in that sense. Um, ultimately, people feel still in Europe nationally, they identify with a certain nationality. That's why they also want to have a national parliament that can ultimately decide about whether their people are sent to uh, the front lines. Because that's what we ultimately talk about. We talk about the gravest decision a government can take uh, to go to war and send its people in harm's way. So I think we need to be very careful about this, have a nuanced debate and always make sure that people feel represented. I, I think it's a fundamental challenge. I'm, I, again, with this, I also do not have any silver bullets, but it is something we should be mindful of uh, when it comes to these discussions about Europe. Thanks. Right. So, uh... More European integration, uh, what does Kuhn Links' position is on that uh, particular issue? Oh, so many things to say. Um, so on, on the last issue of, of the European army, I think, um, so earlier when we were talking about the geopolitical uh, stuff, so for example, economic sanctions, we really think you should, I think the, the sanctions against Belarus, Cyprus was, as a, as a one single country could stop uh, sanctions uh, uh, um, uh, towards it. So we're not able to make a fist together. And I think we should really look at that. And, and also as Europe, as the Netherlands in Europe, um, uh, propose it more, because this is a discussion that we're now having amongst ourselves, but I think it's not very high on our agenda uh, within Europe. So we, we, we tend to see Europe something as what we, we can get from it or as a scapegoat, but, but, but pushing agenda geopolitically, I think we could do more and also demand more of Dutch government. Uh, so it's the first thing. Um, I find the issue on, on, on a European army, I find it very, very hard uh, because I see the point that Kavish and Ruben make, uh, but I also see the geopolitical uh, position that we're in. At the end of the day, with a coordinated approach, you're more effective. And let me be the nuanced person then once in this debate. Uh, I think between the world we're at now, where we don't have a lot of coordination, where a lot of things are still Done bilaterally that we have like we do the NATO, uh, the NATO and then we have Europe. I think there are multiple steps we can take before we talk about having the European army and maybe we should take those steps first and I think it's very important to do that. 
Uh, so have within the European Union strong coordination more forcefully uh, th that strategy. And what we now, if you look at the foreign policy arm of Europe, we basically still have the classic German France divide and then us hanging in there. And I think the first step is saying there is a role there in foreign policy for, and there is a role, but a stronger role with coordination. And then maybe kind of what I'm going to do the, the faith of day, Ruben, I'm going to make a joke again, I'm going to do the, the Ruben strategy, and then maybe come to that discussion, uh, just like with nuclear energy of, of, the, of, this, of the, the army uh, later on, but first uh, the steps in between. All right, thank you. All right, then I see uh, one more raised hand. That's the last uh, question we're gonna we're gonna recognize. Uh, so maybe uh, try to keep it brief, uh, but it's nice to end with another question. So Celia, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I my question is about sustainability. So uh, regarding wind turbines in one's backyard. So Ruben, you mentioned that uh, of course that creates resistance to go against what people want. Uh, but at the same time, you are committed to achieving sustainability goals. Um, so this just seems like a little bit contradicting to me. Uh, so how do you plan on actually implementing action now? That's my question. Yeah, so so we talked about this, 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 this tension eh, between you want to reach your goals, but, you know, not uh, disengage and, and create, you know, encourage populism, so to say. Um, I, I think what, what, what's happening now, uh, and currently all regions in the Netherlands are making plans to have an energy transition and windmills can be part of it. So those plans are being developed right now and they will be collected. And then hopefully, if you add everything, then, then it will be enough for to reach our goals. Uh, and if not, then, um, then we need to make sure that those plans will add up. So we need to be critical towards it and then tell uh, those regions to do more. Um, of course, we should always look at opportunities that are, in that respect, least harmful. So windmills at sea, of course, you do not have that problem. Uh, there are other problems there because space is also limited and we have also, uh, our, uh, of course, our shipping routes that are important for our economy. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it will remain over the next 30 years, it will remain a very difficult tension to reach all those ambitious goals and make sure that there is enough support on a local level. Um, but yeah, in the end, if, uh, if, if there's not enough is done, then we need to make sure and encourage people to do more. Thanks for that question, Celia. Did you, want, you wanted to do a follow up? Um, it's okay, but I want to hear your opinion as well. So go ahead. Now I wanted to do be, uh, be grandma is going to tell, I don't know, we're all too young for this, but I love watching old uh, t um, television news shows from the Netherlands. It's like, it's a great hobby. Hopefully they're translated in English. And one of them is when we started getting gas lines, so we, we used to cook differently and then we, we found the gas uh, things in Groningen and then we started to give gas throughout the Netherlands. And you have these amazing news reports where mainly women back then complaining like this is what are this is not how I cook this is not we cannot handle this we, we don't want to have the gas because I'm used to this old system that I have so and there is always resistance when there's change and I, I'm not going to say don't listen because the argument that Ruben gives listen and understand where the resistance is um, and one of the this is one of the reasons why we think that the, that the, the transition has to be just and has to be good for people so, and we believe in that and we're doing it because it's not like we're not setting the windmills there. Like having good conversations, understanding why there is resistance, changing plans, being creative in it, but never, never using it as an excuse for not taking actions that are needed. Uh, and that's gonna ask a lot from local politicians, from us maybe, uh, and for me, and, and I, hope, I, I hope everyone agrees with that. We should also be honest about what we think and why we do it. So. Being a fair and honest politician is listen, listening to resistance, but not talking to someone's mouth just because you want to make them happy for the short term, um, but being uh, firm and honest about your beliefs. All right. Thank you so much for that. And maybe just to add, let's, let's take those concerns seriously, because I, I like Senna's jokes, but you know, you, using a, a gas for, for cooking, of course, that's, it is different than having- But Ruben, this was not a joke, I meant it. So what we did, you know what we did with the gas, and this is why it's good to watch those TV shows and the, the news. 
what they did is they made fake kitchens that people could go in and experience with the, the cooking and go like, hey, wait a second, this works. And, and this, honestly, this is not a joke. So what I'm, what I'm saying is listening, but not only using it to say, we're not gonna do it, but looking where the resistance is, trying to create a context where trust is built and then going forward with plans uh, that are adjusted. So honestly, this was not a joke. Earlier I made a joke, but this one was not a joke. Now, yeah, now, okay. <laughs> now what I wanted, so if you, just as an example, you know, if you buy a house uh, and you have a mortgage and then a couple of years later, a windmill is built and your house becomes maybe 50,000 euro, the value goes down. That is a serious concern for people. Uh, windmills, uh, turbines make a lot of noise. So if you put it too closely to people's houses, then, you know, you, you had your backyard and your children playing there and it was all, um, it, it was all very pleasant. And then suddenly you have noise all day. Those are very serious things. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's very challenging to, to, but we, we need to take those concerns seriously. That was my, my point. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, obviously, uh, there is a lot more to discuss uh, regarding the topics that we talked about uh, tonight. Um, but uh, looking at the time, I think it's time to start concluding uh, the event. Um, so I hope our panelists enjoyed tonight's discussion uh, amidst these extraordinary and busy times, I can imagine. And I hope that our participants either gained some new insights uh, into Dutch politics, uh, gained some answers to their pressing questions, and maybe, just maybe, even made up their minds about what they're going to vote in two weeks. Uh, but anyway, uh, on behalf of me uh, and the Honors Association, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their interesting insights uh, during tonight's discussion and for their cooperation and enthusiasm in making this event happen. Uh, we really appreciate it and uh, we were honored to have you. Um, I also want to um, use this moment to give a special thanks to our active members, Sinai, Usama, Munya and Julius for their efforts and help in making this event happen. Uh, and of course, many thanks to all the participants who joined tonight's discussion and uh, interacted with our speakers. Uh, if you're interested in more events like this, uh, the Honors Association plans to organize more events in the future that challenge students to think critically about uh, well, the complex issues and topics that uh, we did, like we did tonight. Uh, make sure to follow our social media accounts on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and our new YouTube channel, and check out our website, stay up to date. Um, lastly, the Study Association of the Erasmus School of Economics has asked me to share a survey uh, the, to the participants uh, for an article about the upcoming elections in the Netherlands. So I'll share a link in the chat. Uh, and if, uh, if you would be so kind to help them out, to help them out by um, filling in that survey, that would be much appreciated. Um, so once again, a big thank you from me and the rest of the board uh, to everyone that was here tonight. Stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and enjoy the rest of your evenings. So thank you very much. Peter, compliments for the organization as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You. Had a great evening. Good discussions. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Good, good night. night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.